Uh, Love is ours. Why does it say we're not live? Was disabled on Facebook. Deleted on <gasps> Facebook. It's saying? not showing up for me. It's showing everything was rolling. Go yeah. live. Go live. Oh. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. No, I, I see we're live and I'm getting lots of error messages. So oh, interesting. Oh, well, just more of the <laughs> same. What's going on, everyone? My name is Dr. Gray. Um, here today, not you, oh, hi. not hi. you, <laughs> me, me. I want all of the attention today. Hello, how are you doing? My and name every is day. Ryan... <laughs> My name is Ryan Gray. Uh, here to uh, moderate a lovely panel of pre-med experts for you today. I have with me. Verinia Granum, former pre-health, uh, former assistant dean of the pre-health and STEM advising at Hofstra University. How you doing, Thanks. my friend? Doing great. Thank you. Ready to hopefully talk to some, or at least answer some questions for some from some of our pre-meds out there. Yeah. We get to talk at them, not really talk yes. to them today. Talk, talk, <laughs> talk at them. Yes. That's one of the things I love about uh, Application Academy, that group environment, is we get to actually have conversations mm -hmm. versus here we just get to talk. Uh, yeah. I, listen I like to that. ourselves. Yeah, listen to ourselves. Well, whatever. <laughs> um, also joining me today, Courtney Lewis, former director of admissions at Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine, but expert in all of the pre-med world. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing really well. I've got a little visitor here. This old oh. lady has, has come to, to join us on today's session. And, yes. and for some she reason, so she's very clingy right now. Mm. Yes. And so, yeah. We are here talking pre-med and pets with uh, the <laughs> medical school headquarters team. <laughs> Um, let's, let's rock and roll. We're here to help answer your questions. If you're joining us on Instagram, go over to premed.tv. That's where we will take your questions to answer them here on the show. Um, so if we have some questions, I would love to get going. What do we got? What do we got? Or we don't have any questions. Here we go. <laughs> Fluffy cookie. Let me zoom in a little bit. I got to zoom in. Uh, hello, does research experience have to be medical or lab based or can it be technology focused? Which one is the best for medical school? Thanks. Uh, Fluffy cookie, who apparently is a Dallas Cowboys and Baltimore Ravens fan. I don't know if that can fly, but hey, they're not. I don't think they're in the same uh, conference. The Giants, Eagles, <sighs> Cowboys. Uh, and the the commander. So no, red, uh, the uh, Ravens are okay. Um, <laughs> Verinia, yeah, is there a best for med school? Yes, it's whatever opportunity you're able to get. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best. Um, research is one thing that we kind of feel like, while it's good, it's a good experience. Um, it's not something that you necessarily have to have. Um, for medical school. So it also does not have to be just med medical or lab based. It can be technology based. It can be social science research. The idea is learning in that environment to ask questions, to investigate things. That's the whole purpose of research. So if anyone out there thinks that they have to have some kind of lab research, it's not necessarily required. Do it if you're interested in it. Yeah. Um, but keep in mind that research is research no matter where you're doing it. Yeah. Research is asking questions. Mm -hmm. It's analyzing data. It's performing tests. Yep. Uh, research does not mean I'm poking and prodding another human being or, or pipetting, I'm <laughs> pipetting uh, all of that fun stuff. I, I tell the story all the time of a student who I worked with a couple of years ago who she's probably a fourth year now, third year um, here at University of Colorado. Uh, she was a geologist before med school. She taught at one of the Colorado uh, um, colleges, mm -hmm. geology. Uh, all of her research was in geology, right? Yeah. She studied rocks, and that's research. There you go. Drinks. All right, we're going from cookies to drinks. To drink. <laughs> uh, we are on a food theme here today. I have 3,000 clinical hours from 2013 mm -hmm. to 2015. I ended up getting a neuro PhD, non-clinical, and now volunteer with hospice. How many, quote, recent hours do I need to feel confident that I can apply? 
Courtney, one of the problems we see all the time with students very similar to this is they have these 3000 hours from eight years ago and then nothing recent. It's like, check. OK, <laughs> I'm done. Mm -hmm. What what is a problem with that? Um, well, it's, you know, the environment changes, the experience kind of fades from your mind. And we want to see kind of a continued interest in clinical practice and kind of broadening your breadth and depth of clinical knowledge. And so I would say recent hours is going to be favorable, which you're trying to do. I don't know if there's a target number you should try to reach. Some is better than none. Um, but, you know, it's something that you'll need to work on because if it's hyper-focused in any one area, may not give you enough context to actually talk about and answer the questions that are going to be asked of you if you get an interview and things like that. So really, this is for your benefit as a pre-med student, as an applicant, as somebody who is exploring this as a career path to to do your due diligence and making sure you understand what it is a physician does and how they function in the different areas and then, um, you know, present it to a, uh, an evaluatory committee. Yeah. One of the things I, I talk about recently, I, I had a, a very recent guest on the pre-med years. She's a biology professor now and she did go to med school. And she does not have her medical degree because she got into medical school and realized, oh, crap, I don't like the hospital. And I was like, how could you have avoided that? And she's like, if I would have done more clinical experience. Um, I, I think medical schools are acutely aware of how important it is to understand for you, the student, that you like the environment of a clinic, mm -hmm. of a hospital, of being around sick people, of being mm -hmm. around uh, other doctors and nurses and other healthcare staff, and and that you want to spend your days in your life supposedly doing this, right? Getting several yeah. hundred thousand dollars in debt um, because at the end of the day, this now professor of biology went to medical school, dropped out after a year, and that is a red flag for the medical school when they go through their accreditation process. The accreditation body comes in and goes, hey, why do you have such a high attrition rate? Well, we we accepted people who said they were ready for med school and said they wanted to go to med school and they liked the science and wanted to help people. Um, but we didn't really look at clinical hours and we really weren't sure if they liked the clinical environment. So half the people dropped out. Right. Obviously, Oof. very hyperbolic, but that can be a problem for the med school and their accreditation process. Yeah, absolutely. And plus, you know, we don't want to put people in debt just taking the risk. Like, you know, let's just see how it goes. Yeah. It's too much money. It's too much time. We would be doing you a disservice. Yep. This is a very hard, arduous kind of long path. And so the more knowledge you have of its many facets ahead of time, will help us have confidence that you understand what it is you're getting into. Yep. I mean, look at Dr. Gray. He's <laughs> just I'm just I liked being a doctor. <laughs> I'm jabby today. It's <laughs> <laughs> Man, don't don't add to the trolls on YouTube. We're like, this guy didn't even like being a doctor, and look at him now. <laughs> oh man! No, it comes down to it just for knowing. the good of others. Yeah, he did it for the good of others. Yes, we're all here no. to share the information. Okay. Good question. Good question. All right. Uh, hey, quick question. SXX245. Is it okay to include my hours working as a CNA and time that I volunteered in an ER back in high school with my med school application? Mm -hmm. Vernia, we often say anything post high school, and there's usually mm -hmm. some caveats, some some asterisks that we can uh, <laughs> yeah. add on to that. Um, but oftentimes there are no rules. <laughs> Um, for, for those who weren't watching, that was a, a pre-recorded uh, message because we say it all the time, right? There, there really yeah. isn't technically a rule, although I think TMDSAS does have some limits around what you can put. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it is it is considered patient care experience, clinical experience. The fact that it happened in high school, normally, yeah, we would say post-college, et cetera. Maybe you continue this activity too after graduating from high school. 
before starting college. If you continue that, that's great. That's fine. But as Dr. Gray says, there are no rules. I think if you want to include it, that's fine. And just let the medical schools decide if they're, you know, if they're going to take that into consideration. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oftentimes what, what a student can do is let's, let's say you volunteered in the emergency room and you kept doing that in college sure include those hours and Mm -hmm. include that that start date back in in high school again with the caveat of like if it just stayed in high school you'll probably leave it off um but again there are no rules for the most part so buyer beware Michael, what is the earliest day you can input your LORs and transcripts into the application? Is it the first day, May 2nd, 2023? Yes, Michael, as soon as the application is open, you can start requesting transcripts officially and start officially requesting letters of recommendations. Remember, one of the benefits of using a third-party letter of recommendation system like my LORs is that you can request letters immediately You can store those letters. You can start receiving those letters immediately. And then you can manage all of those letters. And as soon as the application opens up, you can then have us, my LORs, send them to the application service. Again, with today's asterisk day, (laughs) we we cannot um, send to TMDSAS for this first application cycle. Uh, They have a couple extra hoops that we have to jump through that we just learned about. So we're working on that for next application cycle. Yep. And then if you, for anyone who needs to reapply, letters of recommendations uh, need to be resent every year. Transcripts for a Comus don't need to be resent, but for AMCAS do, I'm pretty sure. I think a Comus has a special thing where unless it's updated, you don't have to resend it. Kaya, what would admissions think about my numerous MCAT takes? I have four scores and seven years ago. Uh, (laughs) uh, Fourth is 15 points higher than previous three. Woo! Kaya figured it out. Uh, Previous three were all lower than 501. So, uh, Courtney, this comes up all of the time. I hear from, from parents all the time, from students. Oh, my advisor told me or, oh, I read on on Reddit that uh, taking the MCAT more than once is a red flag. And I'm like, says who? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, if at a certain point, you know, if if you're maxed out and you're taking it just back to back, you know, month, like one month apart and just thinking that it's going to be that drastically different, maybe that is not what you want to be doing. But if it takes a couple tries, that that is okay. I would caution you to obviously feel prepared and don't just go in blind and just say, oh, I'm just going to get one under my belt and see how it goes. Yep. That's what the practice tests are for. <laughs> so please do that. Those should inform you about where you're scoring, give or take, you know, three to five points in either direction. But I have matriculated plenty and I know my fellow deans and directors, MD and DO side, have matriculated people that have taken it multiple times. That is okay. Um, and obviously, you do want to see an increase in the score. Um, what we would look at when we see multiple takes is kind of the time frame. So did you take the first one when you were a junior? Maybe, you know, had you completed all of the curriculum that you needed? Or maybe was microbiology missing and you took that senior year? Did you score better when you had a good chunk of time to just devote to that? And the other takes were while you were in school. So we have information to reference to kind of paint this picture to see why there may have been a difference in the score and what time frame we're looking at. But generally, no, it's not a huge red flag or anything like that. But, you know. Yeah. It's it's the same. Not, not ideal, but. Not, yeah, not it's not a terrible. joke because it costs extra yeah. money and it's more stress yeah. than all this yeah. other stuff. I think it's it's the same answer that I give when people are like, oh, applying to medical school uh, or being a reapplicant to medical school is bad. And the answer is no. 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 Being a reapplicant with the same terrible application mm-hmm. is bad, right? Yes. Taking right. the MCAT three times and getting uh, a 499, a 500, and a 501 is bad because it shows that you haven't improved at all. And then that fourth time you, you got a 515 or whatever it is that you're getting. And then an admissions committee member can go, Oh, they figured it out. 
They right? figured it out. <laughs> they figured mm-hmm. it out. Or they had someone take the test for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've never thought that. So <laughs> I, I watch um, uh, Suits. Have you ever watched the show Suits? It's, it starts with the guy taking the LSAT for other people. So Is that what Meghan Markle was in? Yes. Yeah. Such a good show. Mm, I've okay. never watched it. Oh, <laughs> such a good show. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. So Kara, uh, Kaya, not Kara, Kaya, um, have no fear. You crushed it. Great job. Your, your MCAT score, uh, you shouldn't think twice about it. Just mm-hmm. apply and mm-hmm. be proud. Afwa, I thought upward trend was determined by looking at the GPA at the end of each school year. But my school's pre-med advisor said it's determined by looking at each semester's GPA. Which one is it? I don't, I don't know what the difference I think, is. I think it's both, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's both and. Mm-hmm. Right? We, we get both sets of data. Um, you get it all. And, you know, if you have one semester where it's like I had two Bs and three As, and then it was, you know, three As and two Bs, the next time it's, you know, kind of a wash essentially. But if, if they're just looking – face value, quick glance, it'll probably be through the years, right? Mm-hmm. Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year. Um, but we have all of that information and all those breakdowns. So it's. Yep. Yeah. It's not one or the other. They can look at both no. basically. Yeah. Yeah. And they decide how they want to use that data too. So. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are schools that will look at your last 20 credits uh, science. There was, mm-hmm. there are schools that will look at your last 60 of graduate and undergraduate combined. Uh, every admissions committee, every school will have their own policies and processes and um, slice and dice. So I, I think, uh, Afwa, I think you're um, trying to pick it at straws here. I think at the end of the day, your goal is to get as high of mm-hmm. uh, a GPA as possible every every step of the way from this point forward to show an upward trend. And I'd like to, again, say it may be frustrating to keep hearing like every school is going to have a different process and you never know, but that's what makes this actually great. You don't want every school to have the exact same process because you want there to be some latitude on who they're looking at, what their situation was and and what they deem, you know, appropriate for their curriculum, for what they're looking for in students and things. And that's why people with different backgrounds get in with different academic histories and profiles and things like that. We don't want it to be so cut and dry. You, you should appreciate that people are willing to look at the same data and see different things or pull from different areas. So as frustrating as it is to not have a clear cut answer, it is for the benefit of pre-med students who are trying to get in to have some flexibility and and a broader scope of what's being looked at and how. Yeah, I think uh, I I just um, recorded an episode, actually it was released last week of the pre-med years with Dr. Brian Carmody, a pediatric nephrologist. Uh, he and I talked about U.S. News and World Reports, and he said that's one of the, the big downfalls of U.S. News and World Reports is it's assuming that every school is looking for the same exact student, right? When you when you have this very strict methodology and criteria that ranks every school, you're assuming every school is picking the same students and therefore the same criteria applies to every school. He's like, it's, not. it's just not the case. So you, you can't use one criteria to, to measure every school by. Yep. Yep. And good thing, right? Yep. It takes all types. We do not want a cookie cutter. Yep. Unless they're all like me. <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's a given. <laughs> just joking, my friends. I can just see it on YouTube. Dr. Gray is so arrogant. <laughs> Anna asks, when are you having another session in which you go over people's activities, examples, and give feedback? That was so helpful. Well, Anna. Every week. Every, yeah. Every week. <laughs> Uh, multiple times a week. Let me let me see what our our session is uh, this week. I did um, one yesterday. You did one yesterday. We have other essays today, and then watering events tonight, and then um, let's see. Tomorrow is. I don't see the 
application. I've got two tomorrow. sessions tomorrow. Conclusion tomorrow. Where's the first one? I didn't see it. Anyway. <laughs> uh, and then Friday, I'm doing secondaries. Um or activities. I don't know. There's our, our, <laughs> my calendar's a little out of whack. Um, and but then we're doing, doing something. mock interviews on Saturday <laughs> with uh, Dr. Wright. So, um, Anna, all to say, we do 10 sessions a week at Application Academy, where we do that day in, day out, and we cover different topics every every session. So please join us there. We have FAP pricing if you're an FAP recipient. Um, if you have questions, just shoot us an email, academy at medicalschoolhq.net. Yeah. We so are closing you'll... our doors April mm -hmm. 2nd. Yeah. So you'll be with one of us as an instructor, but... Everybody can be on camera, unmute themselves. It's more of just like a, a workshop versus yeah. a presentation. Yeah. So we're all interacting together. We're all giving feedback. We go through actual submissions. So people who are attending or people who are part of Application Academy, activities, supplemental, secondaries, you know, um, disadvantaged essays, which are kind of changing. Um, for all of the different platforms with all of the different character counts and prompts and things like that. We all just meet whoever is on. Everything's recorded so you can watch it back. We keep track of what we've gone over, but it's not just talking about things in generalities. It's actually mm -hmm. going over actual peers submissions and getting feedback on that. So if you thought that was helpful, you should definitely join Application Academy and you get access to it for like a year. And, so, and we're on there all the time. And I love it. I teach four sessions a week. I say teach, but all I do is really moderate. But um, yeah, it's it's good. It's nice. awesome. So good. So good. All right. Uh, Jason asks, MCAT test date of 526. Do you recommend submitting my ACOMAS slash MCAS applications on the first day they open or wait until my score is released? If the former, how do schools receive the scores? Vernia, this mm -hmm. question comes up all the time. When is too late to take the MCAT? Mm -hmm. um, do you, should I submit? Should I not? We have the whole uh, one school submission yep. game that students can play. Um, what are your thoughts here? So this one's kind of tricky, right? Because they're going to get their score at the end of June, which is right when applications are actually starting to get transmitted. So you actually might have an opportunity to, you know, depends on how comfortable you are with waiting for your score. Um, if you want to wait for that score to, um, you know, decide if you're going to apply or not, you're still in, you're still in that window where you're still considered kind of early-ish. Um, any later than that, then it gets a little bit <laughs> hairier um, because you do have to first get verified. And that's what tends to take the longest amount of time going through that verification process. So what students do is they, they decide instead, I'll just apply to one school when the application opens just to get in, queue, in the queue to be verified. It should be a school that you would still consider attending if you were admitted. It shouldn't be a throwaway school. I see that all the time. It should be. Yeah, you know, I don't understand that. Can it be a throwaway school? No, no. It should be a school that you would absolutely attend if admitted um, to at least get yourself in the line, so to speak, to get verified. That then gives you time to wait for your score and decide if you're going to add more schools later on. So Jason, it's like I said, it's, it's whatever you're more comfortable with. If you kind of want to just make sure you get verified quickly, go ahead, apply to one school. If you really just want to wait and see what your score is, I think it's okay to wait. Um, you'll still, you know, you'll probably get verified if you wait until the score is released towards the end of July. So still kind of sort of pushing into the later territory, but I don't think it will be that um uh, you know, I, won't, I don't think it'll affect you that negatively. Yeah. And and in terms of releasing the scores, technically, AMCAS schools get the score automatically. Mm -hmm. You just need to go into your, your uh, double AMC slash MCAT mm -hmm. portal and release the scores to a COMIS yeah. so that those schools get access to your MCAT score. So they'll see that you have a score pending. Uh, but mm -hmm. by the time you get your score, most schools aren't looking at mm -hmm. your applications yet anyway, because they're just 
starting yep. to receive them. They're just starting to send out secondaries. So I think you're fine there. Yep. Yeah. And then in terms of verification timeline, the big issue is AMCAS. Their their verification timeline is weeks and weeks and mm -hmm. weeks and weeks. A Comus is typically four days <laughs> at kind of at its peak. I don't understand how they get uh, there. They're so much faster. Uh, I don't know if they have some cool I, technology doing it all. I would say at the beginning, it's at least four weeks when they're waiting for transcripts and verification and, and it's a big flood at the very beginning. But yeah, after that, it gets a lot faster. But at the very beginning, I would say it's at least three to four weeks. Bueno question. Uh, for Verinia and Courtney, I don't think I've mentioned, I need to leave in like, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. So okay. I'll, I'll jump off you guys. <laughs> finish up sure. uh, i'm gonna go hang out in an mri scanner for a couple hours <laughs> <laughs> what are Fun we gonna time. do i know right <laughs> the show must go on uh, <laughs> Darely, covid happened my freshman year of college how do i explain the fact that i may not have as many hours as other applicants dora lee in case you haven't heard covid happened to everyone <laughs> courtney i, I don't <sighs> Like, I understand, Doralee, it happened to her. This question is a little, um, I don't know, naive? I, I yes. don't know. Like, there's something just rubs me off. Like, I'm the only one this happened to. Yeah, but also, I mean, I if you can say this, I would count yourself lucky that it happened freshman year. Yeah. <laughs> because you, you still have a lot of years to collect mm -hmm. some clinical experience and hours and everything like that. So um, for a lot of people, you know, some were taking gap years just to gain experience and COVID mm -hmm. happened and they were really out of luck. And so, yeah. yes, it happened. Yes, there are provisions. Yes, you know, all of the offices are understanding of what happened and you still have a ton of time to make mm -hmm. up for anything you feel like you lost freshman year, which is, usually fairly sparse to begin with. So yep. I would say, you know, if you had to be part of the pandemic for your college career, this was about as good as you could hope for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel bad for all the people who were doing their postbacks <laughs> that went yes. uh, mm -hmm. virtual and the med schools are like, well, should we count this postback? It's yeah. virtual. <sighs> you were supposed to be improving your GPA and you just spent 40 grand to do yeah. this. You weren't in person <sighs> in lab. Yeah. Oh, it was a nightmare. So, yeah. so the answer is pretty much you don't explain it. You just go out and get the experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, and Darlie, yeah. like, um, I, I don't mean to be picking on you we get this question all the time from mm -hmm. lots of students covid happened to everyone medical schools know know that covid happened to everyone because it happened to them too right medical schools were scrambling during covid of like how are we going to instruct our kids can we teach medical school virtually shocker they could <laughs> um there there were uh, obviously some adjustments that had to be made and uh they were scrambling do we send students to the hospital still do, like what do we do um, and they figured it out and it's there. They are going to for years to come have students going through the application process who have been impacted by COVID. So uh, there's nothing you need to do to explain it. Mm -hmm. There could. may still be a COVID impact essay potentially when you apply, maybe not. And if you want to explain anything there, you can, but you're fine. I can say that that was a very fun time period. I just... <laughs> I was living my best life then. Um, wasn't stressful at all. Yeah. For those couple no. of years. Yeah. No, it was, it ended up working out and people it all worked it out. out pretty quickly. Yeah. 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 yeah that's the, the one nice thing about humans is we're pretty resilient um, to, to change and to meteors crashing down on earth. Yeah. <laughs> or pandemics. <laughs> that's it. Uh, although I would like to not have another one uh, yeah. in my yeah. lifetime, please should I? We're should good. I, yeah. We're should good. I try sending a letter of interest? A. Um, so uh, a letter of interest, uh, different than a letter of intent. Courtney, I often say a letter of interest is your application to medical school. Like yes, they know your designation. <laughs> that's the designation. Yes. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on letters of interest? I wouldn't read them. If I'm yeah. if I'm just being completely transparent and I, I don't think a lot of my colleagues would have read them, um, 
we read a lot already and and we want everything to be official trackable part of a system and and fileable and so really a letter of interest is is going to be put yeah. somewhere not in your file and yeah. and so uh, you know what would show me interest is you attending my virtual open houses or my events talking to the student ambassador, setting up advising appointments, come and touring the school if you can, you know, seeing you multiple times in these events, that is way better than any piece of paper or email that I could receive to show me that you are interested, mm -hmm. plus the designation, so I have a heads up. So in the spring, you guys are gonna have a plethora of activities, events, virtuals, health fairs, of things to attend, and I would say, please take advantage of those. This is a chance for you to get some FaceTime with the school to show your interest, to get some information directly from them and, and be you know kind of top of mind when they open their application cycle. So really take advantage of these things. They have been kind of poorly attended these past couple of years. And I'm always shocked because you know I was somebody who did the circuit as a director and, you know, I was out there talking to students. I met a lot of people that ended up matriculating that way. And I would say take advantage of them. But yeah, letter of interest. I'm not really interested Yeah, <laughs> in yeah. receiving a letter of interest. <laughs> <laughs> a letter of interest to me is pre-interview. Like, hey, I'm interested in going to your school. I'd love an interview. Like, again, you applied to the school and, and just a, a language thing. When Courtney says designation, that means adding the school to your yes. application as, as a school that you want to, to go to. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't waste your time. Now we can talk about letters of intent separately, but we'll uh, leave that since nobody asked about that yet. Mm -hmm. Jasmine. Hello for non-treads. Uh, I'm doing a non-tread workshop this afternoon with blueprint MCAT at 5 PM Eastern. Assuming I can make it back from my MRIs on time. Um, how would you recommend reaching out to professors you've lost touch with? Should you mention in the initial email that you'd like an LOR or just try to call, uh, get a call with them first? Interesting, nuanced question here, Verinia. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan of of reaching out first. Um, mm -hmm. It's difficult for non trads. You haven't been in school for a while, or maybe you just didn't have an opportunity to reconnect with any faculty. Um, so I'm a big fan of yeah. First, reach out. How are you? Um, if it's on the phone call and you're comfortable enough in that moment to kind of be like, hey, I'm applying for medical, you know, applying to medical school. Um, can I? you know, touch base with you in a couple of weeks about my plans or whatever it is, kind of finesse that. Um, if you're emailing them, you know, it depends on what it, your relationship was like. If you're comfortable saying, you know, I'm reaching out because I need this letter, then go for it. Um, but you might also just, you know, you can also kind of check in with the medical schools that you're thinking of applying to and see if you're able, if you're not able to get a professor's letter, can you submit a different letter, an employee's letter, whatever that might be. They might be able to accommodate that yep. um, in the case of non-trads who've been out of school for a while. Yep. But um, but yeah, I think I'd, I'd probably try to get them on the call first, talk to them. If you can kind of find a way to mention that you're applying to medical school, sure. And then ask, can I follow up with you in a couple of days and, and you know, pr potentially request a letter? Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Some great questions today. Jackie asks, is it possible to be overly focused on a specialty in the application? For example, psychiatry. Uh, Courtney, we often talk about the, the personal statement being, why do you want to be a doctor? Not specifically, why are you interested in being a psychiatrist? Yeah. When, when you would read applications that come in two forms, right? A one form is, I want to be a psychiatrist. That's the only thing I want to do. Um, that's one. The other one is, I'm interested in being a doctor. I'm interested in taking care of people. And if you look at my activities, you could probably assume I'm really interested in psychiatry. Do, do those two tell different stories? And do you like one versus another? Yes. <laughs> I mean, 
Um, I would say that the more open-ended one where, where there's some latitude there, I think is going to be something where you can envision the student in a broader spectrum. Um, if they're hyper-focused on any one area, it's not something that I think would be like an automatic no, but if your school really isn't focused on that or the curriculum or, you know, the ties and you're like, huh, I'm, I'm not really sure if this student is a really good fit here or we would be able to provide the opportunities that the student is looking for. I think you kind of rule yourself out, even though you may think that we want you to know what specialty you're going into. A lot of students, I mean, my medical students were like, I didn't figure that out until I did all my rotations third year. And I was, you know, I had to pick my fourth year and then I really had an aha moment. And so I, I think you run the risk if you put that in your master application that's going out to all of these different schools, unless you were very clear on the missions of the schools and thinking that you were an actual good fit and that they could provide those opportunities, you may rule yourself out of some of them if they if they can't see that that match being there. Yeah, I think I was a prime example of this. Uh, not in my primary application in terms of I want to be an orthopod, I want to be an orthopod. But in my mentality in medical school, starting off our first block, we're studying histology and anatomy. And I completely wrote off histology. Like, I don't need to know this to be an orthopedic surgeon. And I failed my first histology test because I was completely focused on anatomy, both because I liked it and I was good at it. And because I thought it was the most useful for me as a, a future orthopod. And, and schools are, again, uh, keenly aware of uh, perceptions and attitudes of students going through this process. Are you going to um, be attentive and a good participant, whether it's in the preclinical years, learning new materials, uh, but also in your clinical rotations? Like if you want to be a psychiatrist, are you going to participate and, and be a, as useful as possible, uh, as good of a learner as possible? In your surgery rotation, uh, they they want to make sure you're going to be attentful and contributing everywhere along the way. So, and if if they read in your application that you have already written off things, um, then they may not like that. So, yeah, and it shows kind of a rigid way of thinking too. Like you're not yeah. willing to be flexible and consider other things. Yeah, so. it's not a growth mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, uh, I would love, Verinia, for you to have a growth mindset and take over <laughs> as moderator here on, <laughs> on Freeman Absolutely. Office Hours because I'm going to go be a patient and uh, go lay down in an MRI, <laughs> MRI machine for a few hours. So, go for it. Good luck. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful day. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Awesome. All right. I'll be happy to take over then. Uh, Joshua asks, how many hours of clinical experience is enough? <laughs> I, I always hear quality over quantity, but I feel like I've seen quantity have a quality of its own. Hmm. It's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah. As a former director of admissions, Miss Lewis, what are your thoughts on this? I feel like we get this question a lot, Verenia. <laughs> At least, uh, at least, at least a once a session. Yeah, at <laughs> yeah. least once a session when we're doing these open Q and A's. Um, they're above zero, right? You don't want nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but everybody has different roles, different timelines, different areas, you know, that they're in, and things like that. So again, we want to be able to look at any and everything. So how many do you feel is enough to give you enough information to be able to answer, like we were saying, breadth and depth questions about mm -hmm. practicing medicine, about working in a hospital versus a clinic, or what a physician actually does on the day-to-day, -day. what does it actually look like? That's really more of the indicator that we're looking for than any number, because you're gonna yeah. be going up against people that have spent 10 years as an army combat mm -hmm. medic, Mm -hmm. thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. You're going to be up against people that have been scribing for the past three years. Yeah. You have 3000 hours, but you're also going to have people who have done shadowing and MA here and there for the past couple of years. And it's in the couple hundreds, you know? Mm -hmm. And so 
what do you need? What do you feel like you need? And Vernie, I know you answer this question a lot. All the time. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. And I, I don't like this idea or this thought of how many is enough. Enough? Because I don't like that yeah. word, enough. Yeah. Because the, the hope is that you're going into this because you want to make sure that this is what you want to do as a career um, and that you understand that it's forever, that, it, you know, it's something that you're just going to keep doing until you get into medical school. So whatever that is, right? If you're able to get a position in one place, do it there. If you can put together several different experiences that allow you to gain all these experiences, great. But the idea is there isn't a set, like there's no minimum, there's no max. It's just keep doing it, keep going. Um, you're showing yourself that this is what you wanna do. And you'll be able to then write about this in your application and just have more meaningful, uh, a more kind of more understanding of why you want to do this simply yeah. don't think of it as do I have enough yeah. it's an this ongoing, is building this, yep this is building your foundation right this is what you're going to yep. take with you to build upon when you're in medical school to have a point of reference when you're doing yeah. standardized patients when you're doing your third and fourth year rotations and things like that you have to have somewhat of an understanding you can't start at yeah. zero and I also would hear kind of the word enough when it's talking about science courses. I've taken the minimum mm -hmm. requirements for science courses. Is that enough? I'm like, well, you tell me if that's enough because you're going to be taking mm -hmm. 32 to 36 hours yeah. of medical school level mm -hmm. science courses on top of that. So if you feel prepared to take that on, because once you start, you don't stop. If you feel that way, great, because that is what we've said the minimum is. But if you're already trying to skirt and be like, what's the bare minimum I can mm -hmm. get away with to, to do, yeah. as Rania said, it's not really the mindset to be in. Maybe you need to do some reconsidering or, or have some, some heart to hearts with yourself on, on this path because these things are going to just expand and grow and build upon each other and, and it'll be your whole career. And so you need to really enjoy it. And that's part of the reason why we ask you to go out and get these hours is so that you are aware of what you're getting into and what you're doing. Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, Shub Karman. Uh, this is my first time applying to U.S. medical schools. The application process is very different from Canada. Any tips for how to learn about or approach the timeline? Great question. So uh, I, I wish we'd gotten to this sooner, um, just because Dr. Gray wrote a whole book about this. <laughs> he would have told you. Uh, look into potentially um, the application process book. It's part of the pre-med playbook series. Um, that is your, thank you. You can pick one up at premedplaybook.com. That is your premier guide about this entire process from the three different application services to the timeline for each, for, you know, to all the different parts of each application. So definitely check that out. Um, I think it'll be a very good resource for you. Or join the application academy. <laughs> or we can, right. we can help you there. <laughs> yeah. So once you're ready to apply, I think they kind of trying to yeah. figure out the process, definitely the process come check girls. out Application Academy. And good luck. It is very yes. different from Canada. It is. Right. We have time for a couple more questions here. Yeah. John Smith asks, I worked as a PCT um, I'm guessing patient care tech in home as a private hire for a few years. I also did crisis hotline. I'd wanted to get a hospital job, but it fell through. Should I prioritize getting more traditional experience? I'm not sure what they mean by traditional experience, but what do you think? Maybe the means? hospital setting and, yeah. and, you know, things like that. Maybe. Again, up to you. You know, it's, there's no... The minimum qualification is over zero, right? Okay. Um, so if you feel like it would be beneficial to have that, um, to work with patients in a different way, to see a physician's uh, role in a different way, then I would say yes. It, it certainly doesn't harm your application right. to have more options or, or experiences and things like that, but it's, it's really for you and what you're needing. So you know, having that experience, I would assume would be helpful, but up to you. Yeah. And at the very least, maybe some shadowing, if you're able mm -hmm. to get it to at least see what 
a clinical setting is like, since these experiences yep. have not been in a clinical setting, okay. um, potential trying to get some shadowing experiences. Yep. And it can be, it doesn't have to be at a hospital. It can be at a private right. practice or right. outpatient clinic or surgical yep. center nursing or home. Mm -hmm. nursing home. Yep. So yep. there's, there's a variety and, and part of it is just the hustle, right? Some of it's volunteer. Mm -hmm. Some of it is just unpaid and you may pick up two hours here, three hours yeah. here, four hours here, but over a couple months that adds up. And so you got to make the connections. You got to get out there and hustle if you're going to try to find these spots a lot of the time. Yep. All right. Let's see. Do you have anybody else? Oh, yes. So this is Days T. C minus in genetics. Should I retake? It was during the 2020 year. What do you think admissions will say? I was a senior, but was the only downfall I had since freshman year. Yeah, I'd say you have to retake it regardless. It, you know, the fact that it happened during the pandemic, it's unfortunate. Um, but a C minus is not considered a passing grade. So. so I guess my thought would be, are you trying to count this as part of like your biology or, or part of your science prerequisites? Mm -hmm. If so, then yes. Um, if point, you yeah. have mm -hmm. others to kind of meet the minimum, then technically you may not have to, mm -hmm. but again, you're building upon this knowledge. You need to have this material. You're certainly going to build on genetics mm -hmm. um, and, and need to have a good working foundational knowledge of that. And so it would be beneficial and, and good for you to, to have this material before you enter med school. So it certainly wouldn't hurt. So I would, I would agree with Verenia, even if it's not like an absolute requirement because you have other things mm -hmm. that are going to meet the minimums, the content is what really matters. And it would, I think it'd be beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, ultimately if it's a course, you know, if it's a cost thing now you have to, you know, having to go back and retake this class um, and you can't afford it, then, you know, it is what it is. And you don't have, you know, then you don't retake it. You don't have to retake it because it's not a prereq. Um, but as we were just saying, the benefit of retaking it would, would is what we're, we're thinking of in this yep. case. Yep. Good luck. Okay. Jacqueline, how do you decide on a school list? Great question. I have my MCAT mm -hmm. and GPA already, and I'm not 100% sure. What do you, what suggestions, what tips do you have for Jack, Courtney? Okay. I was curious because you have, have helped them from one side too. And, and I did yeah. pathway students, but. Um, <laughs> oh, I can so, give you some tips too. <laughs> so, so for building a med school list and, and I, you know, we both help students do this mm -hmm. all the time, right. As part of our, our cycle advising and things. And mm -hmm. um, so I am looking for a couple of things. I always think kind of outside of the norm of things that people look at, I think looking at curriculum is important how the curriculum is presented does it fit your learning style what resources are available to you as a student there and how are things formatted is it system based is it case based do they have learning specialists mm -hmm. are there tests like every friday or is it a midterm and a final i think that that's incredibly important information and i hear so few pre-meds asking about that about mm -hmm what the actual curriculum looks right. like at these schools. So obviously mission is important. I would say looking at in-state, out-of-state matriculation numbers could be something helpful. You know, if you're looking at one where it's like, ooh, they're basically 100% in-state only and you do not live in that state, mm -hmm. that gives you a good reference point of what your chances may be in getting in there. Now, do you completely rule that out? up to you, but it at least gives you a reference point. Um, I would say look at, yeah, mission, out of state, yeah. curriculum, resources, more so even than like, you know, I don't know. Cause I would well, say about every school has good match rates. It's, it's right. rare, it's usually on the student if they're not matching because right. there's so much help and connections well, and things like that. But yeah, and go it, ahead. 
Well, and in, in this case, Jack, it looks like you're focusing on metrics because you say you have the MCAT and your GPA already. That's great. That's going to open the door potentially for you. But as Courtney was just saying, there's so much more that goes into making your school list. Things like, what are your career goals? What are your plans? How do you see yourself as a physician in the future? And what schools are gonna offer you opportunities to get there? Location, are you willing to re relocate? Are you willing to go, you know, if you're from a cold climate, would you be happy in a warmer climate? You know, these are things that you really do have to take into consideration, how far away you're going to be from your support system. So um, I think we just had um, the banner up for a podcast that, um, Dr. Gray did all about how to create your school list. Um, check it out. Um, you'll see that there's so much more that you can consider beyond just your metrics, curriculum, population that you're working with, all very important things to think about. Very important. Thanks, Jack. Great question. All right. We have maybe time for one more. Since let's we do one more. A little late. Yeah, let's do one more. Let's see. Fringe syringe, interesting <laughs> screen name there. If your school has a committee letter process where a reflection is written, does this mean you don't follow the requirements of individual schools? I'm not sure I understand the question. If your school has a committee letter process, does this mean you don't follow the requirements of individual schools? So I, if I'm guessing correctly here, if you're asking about like if the medical school has a different process for getting letters of recommendation aside from a committee letter? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not clear. That's kind of what I was assuming too. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, if, if we are on the right track, then a committee letter generally counts towards your two science professors, depending on who is part of the committee. If there's a physician that's part of it, maybe that counts as your two science and the physician. You may need a committee and then a separate physician. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just depends on what the committee makeup is, but generally, and you can go and reference this on the letter of recommendation sections on the different platforms. Mm -hmm. So double AMC and ACOM for their platforms, both have very detailed pages on letter of, of recommendation, what they're looking for and what could substitute for each mm -hmm. and what the qualifications are. So I would go go look up those web pages because generally you see a committee letter, um, whether it's a composite you know, letter or if they just put together a packet and things will count for something. Um, but sometimes on top of that, you will need another one depending on the members of that committee. Yeah, and, and, and as our friend Carly behind the scenes is, is emphasizing, some schools will explicitly say that committee letters cover everything. So yeah. regardless of what's included, so just do your research. Do, this is a good thing to look up because letters of recommendation were one of the things that mm -hmm. held up applications the most when it was mm -hmm. on the back end for my team to move through because you need those letters of recommendation to get an evaluation for your packet to be complete, your application to be complete. So make yeah. sure you are looking at, once you make your med school list, make sure that Those you know what it is that they're asking for. Absolutely. All right, friends, I think we've reached the end of our hour here. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Courtney, for stepping in <laughs> with me. You too. Yeah. Taking over for uh, Dr. Gray. Um, as we're ending here, just feel free to check out mapped pro, mapped app or actually no we're calling it mapped now you can yeah. get a free trial of our software where you can track your pre-med process um, use the code uh, 30 days free um, that will give you access to mapped where you can enter in all your courses and your activities and track and see how your um, profile is looking for your application in the future yep. have a great day everyone thanks courtney thanks carly for your help behind the scenes see you we'll next see week you all. we'll see you next week bye Bye.